This is part 16 in our series of lectures on infinite sets, and in this lecture I'm going to show you the proof of the comparability theorem. So this is the statement of the comparability theorem. It says that if A and B are any two sets, then either there exists an injection from A into B, or there exists an injection from B into A. The proof that I'm going to show you of the comparability theorem makes use of a fundamental assumption of mathematics, which can be deduced from the axiom of choice, which is known as Zorn's lemma, and which I introduced to you in the previous lecture video. It says that if script X is any set, and R is a partial order defined on that set, and suppose this set X has the property that every linearly ordered subset Y has an upper bound, then if one can do that, then the lemma asserts that X has a maximal element. In other words, an element X with the property that there's nothing in capital X which is bigger than or equal to that little x. So let me start you on the proof of the comparability theorem. Here the uh, proof refers to the proof of the comparability theorem. So uh, we want to apply Zorn's lemma in the right way. So we have to define a certain set X and a certain partial order on that set X. So we're going to take X to be the set of all functions um, having a domain some subset of A and codomain B such that F is an injection. And what we really want is we want to show that in this set X there exists either an element F having a domain which is all of A or a range that's all of B. Because if we're able to do that, um, if, F, if, if there existed an F in here which had a domain that was all of A, then we would have our injection from A into B. And on the other hand, if we had an F in that set whose range was all of B, then um, we'll, we would be able to prove that the inverse of that is in fact a function from B into A, which is an injection. So in order to do that, we need to define a partial order on this set. And um, the partial order we're going to choose is the following. If we give ourselves two elements, say f and g in this set x, then we're going to say that f is related to g if g is an extension of f. In other words, the domain of g contains the domain of f, but when we restrict g down to the domain of f, the resulting function agrees with f. So then we have to show that um, this is in fact a partial order, and then we have to show that the hypotheses of Zorn's lemma hold. And if we're able to do that, we'll be able to get a maximal element, and that maximal element we'll be able to prove has either the domain that's all of A or a range that's all of B. So that's the idea of the proof. Let's now look at the details. On the top of the screen, I'm just reminding you what is this set X. It's the set of all functions which are injections from some subset of A into B. Of course, we know that that's a non-empty family because, for example, if we take um, a single point in A as our subset, and we can map that one point to any element we want in B, uh, then that's clearly an injection from that particular subset of A into B. So X is a non-empty collection of functions. So we define a relation R on X as follows. We say that F is related to G, provided G is an extension of F. And here's the formal definition. It means the domain of F is a subset of the domain of G, but when we restrict G down to the domain of F, it agrees with F. Then uh, the claim is that R is a partial order. I didn't write the details of that uh, claim, but I think the, the proof is very simple. Um, why is it reflexive? Every, every function is an extension of itself, obviously. And if F is an extension of G, and G is an extension of F, 
then f and g must be identical as functions. Um, I think that's pretty clear. And therefore, this relation r is um, anti-symmetric. And the proof that it is transitive, I think, is also very simple. If, if we have three functions, f, g, and h, and we assume that g is an extension of f, and h is an extension of g, I think you'll see that it's quite easy to prove that h is also an extension of f. Okay, so now we want to apply Zorn's lemma to this um, collection of functions x in order that we can obtain a maximal element. So we give ourselves y, a linearly ordered subset of x. That means for any pair of functions f and g in y, either f is related to g or g is related to f. Now in order to uh, apply Zorn's lemma, we have to prove that y necessarily has an upper bound. Now for this purpose, it's going to be uh, convenient for us to view functions as being subsets of A cross B, because then we get to use a set theory uh, notation in order to describe them. So we're going to define H to be the union of all of the F's such that F is an element of Y. And the claim is that H is an upper bound for Y. So first of all, we have to convince ourselves that H really is an element of X. In other words, um, that it's really a function, and that it's really an injection from some subset of A into B. Uh, once we are able to show that, I think it's going to be obvious that it's an upper bound of Y, uh, because it's the union, and therefore... Um, its domain is going to contain any of the domains in the um, in y uh, of the functions that sit in y, and that when we restrict it down to um, any uh, of the domains of a function in y, that the functions agree. That's just what we mean by the union. So it's going to be obvious that it's an upper bound, um, but we we have to prove that in fact it's a function and that it is injective. So that's that's what we do next. So let's now prove that H is in fact a function from some subset of A into B. So it's obviously a relation. Oh, by the way, here I'm reminding you what this H is. It's the union of all of the F's that lie in Y. So it's clearly a relation because the union of any relations is a relation. It's just a certain subset of A cross B. To see that it's a function, we do the usual thing. We give ourselves an element of its domain and two elements of its codomain, and we assume that xy1 and xy2 both lie in H, and then we have to convince ourselves that y1 and y2 are equal. Now what does it mean to say that xy1 lies in H? To say that something is in the union is to say that there exists an element, f, okay, so... Um, there exists an element f such that xy1 is an element of f. That's what it means to say that xy1 is in H. And similarly, to say that xy2 is in H is to say that there exists a g in y such that xy2 is in g. Now we're going to use the fact that y is uh, linearly ordered. That means that f is either related to g or g is related to f. And that means that either f is an extension of g, or g is an extension of f. And that means that these elements are either both elements of f, or both elements of g, whichever one is the extension of the other one. But f and g are both functions, and therefore to say that these are elements of functions is to say that y1 equals y2. So that gives us a, that y1 equals y2, and therefore that proves that h is in fact a function having domain a certain subset of A. Now we're going to next show that H is injective, and I think the proof of that is just as simple and is very similar. So to see that a, um, a function is injective, we give ourselves two elements of the domain, and we assume that the values of the function are the same, and then we have to prove that x1 equals x2. Well, just as before, um, to say that um, 
x1 and x2 are elements of the domain of h, that means x1 comma h of x1 um, is an element of h, and x2 comma h of x2 are elements of h also. Therefore, just as in the previous paragraph, um, just using the definition of this union here, that means there exists f and g in y such that x1 comma h of x1 is in f, and similarly x2 comma h of x2 is in g. And once again, we use the fact that y is linearly ordered to assert that either f is an extension of g or g is an extension of f. Um, we'll just argue one of those two cases. So let's say g is an extension of f. Then that means that since x1, h of x1 is in f, then it's also in g. And so now we have both of these things are in g. And since g is injective, it follows that x1 equals x2. And so that proves that H is injective. So we've now verified all of the hypotheses of Zorn's lemma. In other words, we've shown that given any linearly ordered subset Y of X, there exists an upper bound. Okay, so the conclusion of Zorn's lemma is that X must have a maximal element. Let's call it F, capital F. And my claim is that either the domain of F is all of A, or the range of f is all of b. So to prove this, I'm going to argue by contradiction. If it's not the case that this happens, or this happens, then that means this doesn't happen, and this doesn't happen. That means that uh, the domain of f is a proper subset of a, and the range of f is a proper subset of b, and so I can find an element x that's in a, but not in the domain of f, and I can find an element y that's in b, but not in the range of f. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to convince you that I can create a new function that's an extension of capital F uh, that's still in injection. So what we do is we adjoin to f this pair x, y. In other words, I'm saying just simply define f prime on a bigger set, namely the domain of f, union x, and I'm going to let f prime agree with f on the domain of f, but I'm going to define f prime of x to be y. So that's a proper extension of capital F because xy doesn't lie in capital F. That's, that's what we showed in the um, previous few lines. So now we've produced an extension of f, a proper extension of f, and that contradicts the fact that f is supposed to be a maximal element of x. So that proves that either the domain of f is all of a, or the range of f is all of b. Well, if the domain of f is all of a, then that means that f is an injection from a into b, and therefore we've shown this. And if, on the other hand, the range of f is all of b, well, then I claim the f inverse is, in fact, a function from b into a, which is an injection. Well, we know f inverse is always a relation uh, from b into a, um, but the fact that the range of f is all of b means that the, that the domain of f inverse is going to be uh, all of b, and the fact that um, capital F is an injection allows us to prove that, in fact, f inverse is a function from b into a, not merely a, um, a relation. So it's the injectivity of f that's going to give us that. Um, and the fact that um, f inverse is injective just comes from the fact that f is, is a function. Okay, so I'll leave those details to you to, to think about, but I think they're quite, quite easy to see. So in that case, we would have f inverse is a function from b into a, which is injective. That would prove this. And that completes the proof.